I was I'm born and raised in uh, Northern California. Um, I'm actually born in San Jose. I'm a rare uh, native of Silicon Valley. There aren't many of us around. And um, went to school initially in um, then we moved out to the country area south of San Jose. Uh, my father at the time was an engineer with IBM. They had a plant down there, so we moved out and had a beautiful house in the country, which, which is probably why I, I like living in the country now. <laughs> it's where I grew up with. Pretty normal childhood, youngest of three. You know, quite quite a bit of uh, age difference between my older brother and my older sister. It's like six years between each of us, um, so, oh. but I was the youngest. Um, and and then that's kind of an important thing because you know what what my childhood was like. You know, my parents were very sort of you know driven people, good great parents, but but driven people, and and so. I was actually left on my own quite a bit, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It sort of fostered a lot of independence in myself. Uh, but my uh, my father, uh, he was a very talented and accomplished mechanical engineer. Uh, in, in fact, he, while at IBM, he invented much of the mechanical technology that makes disk drives work. Uh, he was working on the first large, these 14-inch Winchester disk drives, multi-plattered, <laughs> huge things, right? Wow. That I literally you know we're, we're around my house we used to play frisbee with with them and, uh, <laughs> and uh and and he was so he and there was always a project he was always doing something he built a couple boat boats in our driveway uh, always fixing something always making something and the thing that he created that really changed the course of technology in many ways was he developed in the first disk drives, the first prototypes they were using, they, you know, I don't you know how a disk drive works. It has this magnetic disk that spins at a very high speed, mm -hmm. and this this uh, little reader which moves around the disk very accurately and very quickly, um, and it has to fly at a certain height above the magnetic disk for it to work properly. And they were trying to get it to work. They were using compressed air to you know try and create this situation where it would function properly. And he had this idea, which was to shape it like a wing. So literally, literally, it would create its own lift and and dial that shape in, so it would fly literally at the exact proper height among the disk drive. Which that little piece, of my dad still exists in every disk drive that, that's ever made. Um, and uh, unfortunately, IBM owned the patent. But uh, he, uh, so that was one thing. Uh, then my my mother, uh, who was an amazing creative person, she started her sort of professional life as a, as a model. Uh, and then after her and my father were married and had kids, she was, you know, a homemaker, but really a craftsperson. She was always making, painting, doing whatever. I, I used to joke that our, our Christmas tree was like a piece of performance art, right? It was every year, <laughs> every year it was different, right? They used to be like, mom, why is it, you know, this year it's all white with pink bows and pink <laughs> ornaments and next year it's, it's plaid. And, you know, it's just, that was, that was her thing. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I grew up in this kind of environment, right? And, and I, I never really realized that, you know, all our furniture was um, um, mid-century modern Danish teak furniture. Mm. And I just, I just thought, well, we're different. It's a little weird. You know, all my friends have these overstuffed couches with plastic covers on them <laughs> and all this stuff, but that's just the way it is. And, um, but the other thing was my, my parents were both entrepreneurial. My, my father, he and uh, five other engineers left IBM on the same day to start a company to go into competition with IBM huh. um, ca called ISS. This was in 1968. Uh, so it was literally one of the first sort of Silicon Valley spinoffs. Uh, and, and then later in life, my mother started a children's clothing company um, on her own and did, did that for a number of years. And so, you know, I, I think that's another important thing is I sort of grew up with this, okay, if you want to do it, just go do it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I think that really, you know, that between having a lot of time to myself, which I was always in the garage, building bikes, doing whatever, and then seeing this, you know, this sort of, you know, project oriented mentality of our home, it, uh, really, you know, shaped, shaped me and how I, how I looked at things. And, um, so, so how I got into design is, is also an interesting story. And, and it also, you know, I, I've um, come to be a big believer in destiny in the universe and life paths that are ascribed for you because I, I, I began studying engineering. I was in high school and, you know, at, like you do, you talk to the 
a career counselor at the end of the year and, and he look, looked at my transcripts and said, okay, you're, 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 you have decent grades in math and science. So, you know, you're be, an engineer, your, father, an engineer. Your, father, <laughs> yeah. your father was an engineer, yeah. you're an engineer, right? Um, what he didn't look at was I had straight A's in shop class <laughs> and, and straight A's in art class, yeah. you know, uh, but that, you know, it was interesting. If you look back, I mean, that's, a, I think that's a problem with that sort of system where you don't really, yeah. the thing aren't really recognized. Right. So I, 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 I didn't have good enough grades to go to Stanford. My father was probably thankful for that, uh, but it was, he went to Stanford. <laughs> uh, so I just, you know, I wanted to stay close to home. So I enrolled in San Jose State University, which was a, de a decent state school. For um, engineering? For engineering. I started out, um, his classic, I started out in um, civil engineering because I thought, wouldn't it you know, be cool to make bridges and stuff? That sounds really <laughs> great. And then someone told me, yeah, all, and this person was right, you know, all the money's in electrical engineering. So I said, okay, I changed electrical engineering, not even really knowing what that entailed. <laughs> and, uh, and I hated it. I, I, and even, you know, the first year of engineering school, you don't get in any core engineering classes. It was all physics and calculus and mechanics. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, I just felt, you know, it just didn't feel right. It felt like, you know, the, and the way that, and again, this is the beginning of school. It was sort of, okay, here's a problem. Here's a textbook, go look up the solution. Mm. And uh, I didn't really resonate with that. And I felt my mother's side of the, my, my brain calling me. So I decided one day to go over to the art department. And I walked into the building and went in this door on the first floor. And right in front of me was this display case full of industrial design artifacts, um, uh, renderings, models, sketches. And I just stared at it. And, and I just, you know, instant, almost instantly. I don't know how long I was standing there, but I just said, "This, this is it, right? This is, mm. this is what, this is resonating with my heart, and this is something I want to do." So I went over <laughs> to the um, administration building and changed my major, which um, really pissed my dad off. He, uh, <laughs> and, and I'll never forget it. this. This is a quote. He said, uh, "The industrial designers are the guys who specify the paint." And it usually peels off. <laughs> and, <laughs> it sounds like an engineer talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know, undeterred, uh, I you know, this is this is what I want to do. So, and and then went off to design school and, and never looked back and and loved it. Did did really well. But more importantly, I you know it was you know I think it's one of those things I've, I've told my kids. You know, finding your life's calling. It's you know when when you're when you're doing something at two or three in the morning and you just keep doing it. And you don't even want to go to sleep. And that's when you know you found something, right? Yeah. And and that's the way I was. I would just like stay up literally all night and you know go to my eleven o'clock class and just you know and and just just loved it. I you know I almost couldn't believe after going from a year of you know getting the shit beat out of me in, in, in calculus and physics <laughs> and everything, you know, all of a sudden I'm just drawing, you know, and doing you know it was hard though. The the instructor would say, okay, go home and draw you know fifty sketches of objects in your home. Mm come back the next day and say, okay, go back and do 50 more. You know, it was that kind of, wow. you know, and I, and I realized later he was really teaching you muscle memory and, you know, and how to visualize and, you know, and, and forcing you to look at things differently, but it was, it was hard, uh, but it was, it was fun, hard. And, uh, so that's how I found design. Interesting. And, and you know, it was, uh, again, I, I just, for me looking back, there was this path, right. And this path that was almost you know, laid out for me that I just kind of luckily followed. I always say if I, <laughs> If I went in another door, you know, I might have, you know, be a starving sculptor today or something. So. <laughs> uh, that, that's great. Um, I mean, it sounds <clears throat> like your dad was actually very inventive. Um, I mean, I, th I feel like mechanical engineers tend to be a bit more inventive than others. Um, yeah. But uh, in general, engineers sometimes are are a certain type of person and they think a certain way. But well, it sounds like your yeah, there's different is... schools. I mean, of course, a lot of engineering is, is really about... Um, predictability and, and, mm. you know, functionality and making things, you know, being able to be repeatable and, and, and of course that's important, but yeah, my dad was, he was a problem solver. Mm. I, I remember he, I was really pissed off at him because I, I got one of those, um, you know, the telescoping bike pumps, you know, you just put on your frame on your bike mm -hmm. and he took it and destroyed it because he was, <laughs> um, he had this idea for, after he did the startup company, ISS, he went to work for Sperry. And they hired him to develop a, a new disk drive mechanism. And he had this idea of having a, um, 
a sort of telescoping cylinder that this wheel kind of drove on, right? And and would cause it to go in and out. And so he prototyped that with my bike pump and ruined it and <laughs> and never replaced it. So, <laughs> so, but but you know, that was the kind of kind of person he was and that was the stuff that I observed, you know, as a kid. That's funny. I did not know that San Jose had an industrial design program. Yeah. I, I, it was actually a good program. And that was another serendipity that, you know, for um Again, my dad was probably thrilled because at that time, if you were a resident of the state, I think my tuition per semester was like a hundred bucks. Right? Wow. <laughs> and, um, but it turned out, you know, it was at that time, the only design school in Silicon Valley that, that was beginning to, you know, obviously take off as a development culture. Mm. And so you, you did have a fair amount of professionals around the school and it, and it did, you know, it turned out, uh, had, had a good program. It was very... It was a very practical program, a very, very much around skills and problem solving, um, which you know I think really shaped me too as how I approach my work. It is really, um, but I think it was a good education. Right? I, mm -hmm. I see a lot of students today that come out of schools that that are a, a little more theoretical or a little more about um, you know design thinking as a process, which is very valid, but they come out lacking the sort of ability to just act actually go figure out how to make something right which um hmm. which i've always felt is really important just knowing having that burning desire to actually make something and knowing how to do it how to get there and repeat it and all those things that are you know, really sort of part and parcel of design the industrial design which i i view as you know in many ways as a craft as as much as it is hmm. um anything else um, that's a great take. So do you mean, um, I'm curious about the, the last statement you made about uh, <clears throat> recent grads not having perhaps the skill set of knowing how to make things. Do you mean physically making things by hand? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, yes. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, there there, there is sometimes I reel off like the, the old school, like you, know, you need to get out in the model shop and you know cut up some foam. Right. But, but there was part of it that, you know, it was part of the craft part I felt when I went through learning was really making things and understanding that difference between a 1.5 millimeter radius and a 2.5 millimeter radius, mm. right. And what that really was like. And mm. uh, th that that's part of it. But I think more, when I say that it's more, there is, um, you know, a, a part inventive part, technical part, artistic approach of actually figuring out how to shape and create something. And then, make it right I, I often say that one of the differences between a good designer and a great designer is a good designer can make something amazing once you know a great designer can figure out how to make that in hundreds thousands millions right and and really figure out how to you know work the system to really produce and replicate that one thing like right? that one perfect thing mm. which is which is an enormous task to do so so i i, get, I see a lot of the students who are sort of lacking that sort of desire to just actually and and again i sometimes refer to it as a craft which is okay how do i actually not only design and create but build this thing you know and get it out in the way that i had envisioned right so you're talking about kind of the um the i guess you call it mass production aspects of the object yeah it is and there, and there is uh there is um quite a bit of and it's not just the technical side of it there is quite a bit of understanding of how you you know what it is about a thing that you've created and how you're going to make that and how you're going to uh, push the system around and 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 maybe more so um get people to buy into your idea and help you make it there's mm. there's just a lot that goes into that so and, and that's something you know to be honest i didn't learn all of that in school it sort of set a foundation for that i learned learned most of that in the, the 20 years after sure Sure. You know, going going through the school of hard knocks, so to speak. <laughs> well, I think that's very interesting. Just <clears throat> real quick, because in in our profession of architecture, there we do perceive a, a similar kind of gap. That's and that gap is increasing. The gap between academia and the profession. And mm -hmm. you know, you had mentioned kind of theoretical versus um, knowing how things get made or how they would go into mass production. Obviously, with architecture, there's not a lot of mass production, but there's a similar mm -hmm. kind of schism. Um, in that schools are, are, and students are becoming more and more theoretical, generally speaking, um, mm -hmm. in the broad scope. And um, there's kind of a lack of, of understanding of what it means to, in our case, build physical things and understand yeah. what it means, even a small scale, to 
be in a wood shop and make something out of wood and mm. and and other kind of structural systems or building systems so yeah. it's fascinating to hear that maybe there's something happening that's somewhere in industrial design yeah no it, it definitely is and it's uh, it's funny you say that um i we built this house here which is an amazing uh, beautiful modern structure and I was obviously deeply involved in the design process, but I, uh, my architect, I think, was thrilled because I, I literally almost took over the, the, construct, the implementation and construction process. <laughs> <laughs> um, because one, I, I loved it and I wanted it to be just right, right? So uh, it was, um, you know, it was funny. I was there at every meeting just trying to help <laughs> make sure, you know, you're driving the contractor crazy because- I was gonna say. <laughs> Well, you know, it was, I began to realize that, you know, I, I was, um, you know, from across the room, I can see that the difference in a, in a gap when it changes from, you know, three millimeters down to two millimeters. Right? So uh, that's just what you're trained to do. And so they would be like, what? No, it's fine. No, no, come here, let's measure this. I'm going to show you it's not right. <laughs> um, and they were, that was their worst nightmare. That's so funny. Uh, yeah, and, and those kinds of gaps and, and reveals and thresholds are particularly evident in a modern or contemporary type of structure. <laughs> There's not a lot of hiding that takes place. Well, and it's similar to in industrial design when you get to that stage. You, there, there, are, there are a lot of um, constraints around mass production depending on what methodology you're using to make something. You mm -hmm. have to know how to manage those, right, and, and know how to still go through that process and get this thing up that looks the way you intended. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is a lot of things that you, you, know, you have to t take into consideration, and, and there are a lot of compromises. Right? And I often say that you know, when we go through this process, what you're really fighting against is the death of a thousand cuts, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you know, you incrementally, all these little things happen to your, 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 your baby. And it, by the time it gets, gets the end, it doesn't resemble what it did in the first place. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. knowing, that, how to, knowing how to manage that. That's a super good point. <clears throat> it's, it's yeah. interesting to think, I'm trying, I'm thinking about like, you know, like industrial design versus architecture. And I can't imagine what it is to create something that, you know, like, like thousands or millions of people are going to use, right? That's very cool. I feel like actually our job is in a way easier because we just have to make this one client happy, right? <laughs> when yeah. what you guys do, you design products and therefore you have to make whoever's buying it happy. And mm. yes. it's uh, it's a, it's something I've never actually thought about until today, but I think it's it's very interesting, <laughs> the differences. Yeah, it is. It is. It's and, and it's challenging. You know, there's challenges in, in every, every design pro profession, but really sort of, you have to, you know, it, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting balance because I, I do think it's important, you know, when you look at the things that are sort of the difference again between good and great, when the great things usually there is someone there who is very passionate about mm. making this thing and, and making it just right and, and really wanting to, you know, produce something that really delights people and, 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 and is, is wonderful, you know, and, and then there's this part of it where, okay, but it, it has to be commercially successful. Mm -hmm. right? So you, you ultimately, that's what you're hired for, right? Mm -hmm. Is to create something that will be produced in mass and people will desire and buy. And there's so many things that go into that. So it is, it is part of the uh, thing that one of the reasons I did become fascinated with industrial design is this um, relationship that people have between with things, with objects, mm -hmm. right? As, as a, as creatures, we, we, surround ourselves with things that we use in many ways to define ourselves and, um, and delight ourselves. And, you know, when we, you know, the car that we get into, the shoes that we wear, the furniture that we buy, the house that we have, all these things, you see that, you know, that we in many ways use, you know, as, as expressions of ourselves. I've always found that relationship really fascinating and, and really wanted to understand it and how you actually take in ways, take advantage of that, right? The, you know, how do you create something that people are magnetically drawn to? That's not just, you know, function. It's not just usefulness. It's I, desire. You know, I really, right. I, there's, you know, I could choose, you know, a, an array of things. Why does this one attract me and fascinate me? You know, that's, that's a you know, question I've, I've, been, I've been fascinated by. Mm. And I would imagine creating a, pro a product that has all the different attributes you kind of alluded to um <clears throat> that gets created in the end is difficult to do for many reasons but one of them is the kind of thousand death by a thousand cuts you mentioned mm -hmm. that it's very easy for the clients the people who are the marketing experts or whoever to kind of chip away at the thing to 
and then but slowly the kind of the concept or the spirit of the thing kind of erodes until you're left with a, a product or a creation that's bland or soulless it doesn't have that spirit of of what it intended to have yeah well yeah there, there's a number of you know sort of um, uh, um, disciplinary um, challenges to go through when you're you, I mean you know one of the things that, that is important is that you you know to create something right you you can't do that alone Right. Mm -hmm. you, even if you're the CEO of a company and you own it entirely, you, you can't do that alone. You have there's an army of people all through the process from defining what something is all the way to shipping it out and then selling it in the world. So, you know, one of the things, you know, I, one of the questions I always love, I speak to universities a lot and I enjoy talking to design schools and I'll always get this. Well, you know, what what looking back, what would what would you have done differently or what things would have you learned differently? And, and I, I always say, you know, um, take a public speaking class, take an acting class, take a comedy class, right? Do <laughs> learn, <laughs> learn how to communicate to people effectively because, you know, at some point you, you have to figure out how to enlist this army, right? To mm -hmm. follow in a vision, right? And, and the thing, you know, from a disciplinary point of view, you mentioned marketing, you know, essentially in that area that, um, they, a lot of people try and rely on what they know right now hmm. and what they, what they think people know right now. And they'll go out and talk to customers and, you know, and talk to them about, you know, do you like this thing, right? Is this thing that you see? And, and people's frame of reference is only what they know, not, not what they don't. Not that that information isn't, isn't valuable. You know, I, I think if you're really sort of asking questions to understand how someone lives their life and, and what are the pain points that they have and what are the opportunities that exist there, that's great. But if you get into this sort of going out and asking your audience, what do they want? Mm. You're almost always going to give them something that they already have, right? right. Um, which, lead, which leads to a conservatism. Um, and then the, this, the other part of it, you mentioned on the, the implementation side is, you know, there, there is this really tightly coupled relationship between innovation and risk. Right. Mm -hmm. you, if you're innovating, you're by fault doing something that has by default doing something that hasn't been done before. So a lot of the development process is centered around the idea of mitigating risk, right? that you're, you're trying to get this thing through the system. You're spending anywhere from five to fifty million dollars to you know, produce this thing. Yeah, you don't want it. You're going to try and take out as much risk as you can. And, and that starts to, again, push people to things they know or things that they've done before and things that are predictable. Mm -hmm. And so, so it is this, this battle of, okay, we, we, we want to do something different here. Yes, it's a new material that has to be tested, or yes, there's a new production technique that we haven't done before, but we think it's going to work. Let's try it. You know, there's all these sort of things you need to do to actually make something, right? And when you go back and if you look at, for example, in the work you guys do, if you start to look at some of the great um, furniture that... Uh, for example, um, Ray and Charles Eames did, they were always pushing mm -hmm. production, right? They're always pushing material. They were always pushing production. They're always, you know, and, and to do that, they really needed great partners, you know, that, that were aligned with, 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 with that vision. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the same thing. So, you know, back to what you need to know to how to do, in addition to being a great designer, you have to really be a salesman or salesperson <laughs> and really yeah. know how to, you know, enlist people in this. And, and yeah, you're going to have to put in some extra work and you're going to have to take some risks, but you know, but what the potential is, is what makes that exciting. Yeah, that's well said. It's very interesting. I, I like the point about alignment and finding people, convincing people <laughs> after mm -hmm. you've taken your comedy or acting course, yes. which is a funny thing you say that because I've said a couple times in here, I'm like, you know, I, I think I should take an acting course, not to become an actor, <laughs> but just to improve on, on communication. Um, but then finding people to, to convince them or people that you're in line with to, yeah. to go on this mission and do something innovative. And it's, a, it's an interesting point that the innovation and kind of the assurance are two things that are kind of like an opposition in a way. Yeah, I, I, it's a, so the, I mean, the other part of it, which I think is important, is storytelling. Mm. And, you know, when, when I'm, you know, there's some presentations we do where we're just like, okay, here's the work, here's what, you know, what, what, here's kind of what we're thinking. But, you know, when we're really trying to get someone to do something, I always take this approach of a, telling a story, and there's a beginning and a middle and an end. And you start at the end, right? Just <laughs> what, you know, what is it that you want to end up having your audience behind and make very clear about that. You go back to the beginning and figure out, okay, how am I going to engage them instantly 
in a, in a provocative way and then tell this story in the middle that builds to this conclusion. Hmm. And, and that, that's, that's part of, of selling people on your ideas. You know, m- most of my younger staff will just, you know, when we're presenting, it's just like, oh, here's concept A and it's this <laughs> right. and that and that. And oh, here's concept B and it's got this and this and that. And, you know, it's sort of, okay, well, which one do you like? And I said, no, start over. <laughs> which one do you like? And, and how are you going to tell me a story that's going to get me to like it? You mm-hmm. know, that's, that's, the, that's one of the keys. That's interesting. Um, so kind of tracking your story. So you finish at San Jose. Um, what happens afterwards? I understand in 84, uh, you co-founded your own mm-hmm. consultancy and you hit mm-hmm. a number of jobs afterwards and leading you up to your current um your current office, let's call it uh, mm-hmm. ammunition. Yeah. Well I, well, when I got out of school, I actually started working in a design office while I was in school, uh, which I think it was, was again, super valuable. I, I really, you know, by the time I was a senior, the, the schoolwork seemed a little um, boring and simplified, you know, but mm. because I, I was, I, so what I did, and this is another uh, thing, I think it, from my upbringing and of this, I, I sort of, Develop this philosophy, which you know, which is common, which goes something like, uh, "Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness." <laughs> and I was, I actually was hired as a model maker. That's how a lot of you know, when you're in design school, hmm. you know, I got hired to work in the shop and basically sand primer, and you know, get help put things together. And so I was doing that for you know about six or nine months. I don't remember. And I had this is a company called GVO, which in they, it was in Palo Alto, and at that time was the largest design firm around. And uh, I noticed I, there was an engineer um, who was working on a project by himself. It was this hormone implanter for cattle, and he was working out the mechanism. A real, really creative guy, and liked him a lot, and we hit it off. So I just started working on the project as a designer, <laughs> and you know, whatever time I could, and doing sketches and giving him advice and. And so it literally designed this thing and, um, you know, without ever really being given permission. <laughs> and what, what happened was in this particular studio, they were very, very much about, you know, the business of running a consultancy there. It's like, okay, here, wait a minute. Here's this guy. We're, we're probably paying, you know, 10 bucks, nine bucks an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and he's an effective designer. We could use that. Right. So that, um, that allowed me to just start jumping right into you know running projects and when i look back i'm actually amazed at the amount of um rope that they gave me i would never do that i would never let you know some guy you know (laughs) not even out of school in front of clients or anything right but they um that's the you know that was just kind of the environment so again i was very lucky to fall into that and and able to uh, gain some experience and then I, i i got involved on a project which was with uh a startup company and they were called mindset and they were making it was this this was in the era of the dominant computer platform was the ibm pc and they were building an ibm pc compatible with a very um, high performance graphics engine that could be used for creative work it could be used for gaming a little bit ahead of its time Uh, but they wanted to do a unique industrial design and so uh, they um I ended up on the project and they were amazing. They just gave me an enormous amount of freedom and um, were willing to put in the, the money and time to produce it correctly. And so this, this product, it went out, it won um, a gold design order from the IDEA. It was put in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, so here I am like 24 years old, <laughs> oh my. a product in MoMA. Uh, which, you know, at that point, my father finally said, okay, all right, maybe you made a case. <laughs> um, but, you know, so then that was just a, you know, another opportunity that, that fell in my lap and I took advantage of. So I think that again, you know, it's for me and something I encourage with my children is sort of, you know, obviously there's an art to breaking rules, but don't be afraid of it. Uh, and because, you know, otherwise you'll be placed in, 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 boundaries and I, often, I like to say boundary boundaries are only there to know when you cross them <laughs> you know it doesn't <laughs> doesn't mean you can't it just means they're they're there to you know you just know if you've crossed one that's be aware of it and um so that you know that that really sort of slingshotted my career mm. and while working at gbo i started working with with 
two other designers, um, Gerard Furbishaw and Jeff Smith. And Gerard was actually my roommate from college. He got me the job there. And we just really connected as a trio. We had, uh, it was one of those things, this sort of marriage of um, strengths, right? I was the creative person. Gerard was the technical person and, and Jeff was more of a um, process systems thinker. So we just found we meshed really well. And we started doing, you know, meeting after work at the pizza parlor across the freeway uh, to <laughs> talk about, you know, starting our own company. And um, we had uh, no idea how to do it. Uh, and then we somehow there was there was a uh, the, the business development director of the company somehow I don't remember how found out we were thinking about this and he came to us and said look I want to start a company I've got hundreds of hundreds of potential clients just waiting for me join me and we'll do this so so we did that hmm. um, and it turned out he, he didn't really have hundreds of clients <laughs> um, okay. and waiting and it, it just uh, um, kind of languished and. We, we basically had to leave that situation, which was hard, but we said, this is, we just want to do this our way. Right. And, uh, and I, I remember I borrowed $5,000 from my parents. Um, we started off with a few clients, really didn't pay ourselves very much for a long time, but eventually that was, uh, what, what was, that was lunar design. Hmm. And we, and that was the name. That was what I called my freelance business when I was at GBO because I was quote unquote moonlighting. I thought that was really cute. Um, so I called it Lunar Design, and um, and so we finally we created Lunar, and and you know within a short period of time, we saw about a twenty person um, design office wow. in Palo Alto. Wow. Yeah, it, it was it was great. We you know it was so much fun. It really was. It was just, and you know. From a business point of view, creating and running a business, we had no idea what we were doing. So learning on the fly. But again, you know, I, I, we were young enough to, you know, live on, you know, not not a lot and, mm -hmm. and just be happy about what we were doing. And so we did that. Uh, and and uh, was, after about, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask: Was there ever a thought that you should be working at a big industrial design established company? for X number of years, putting in your time, so to speak, before you would start your own agency um, no, as, as, as I, a I path? Think, is that like a common thing? I... No, that is. That is certainly, and it's, it's a place to learn. Uh, you know, I, I was, um, so one of the things I didn't mention, when I was in school, I applied for an internship at, at Hewlett Packard because hmm. everyone, oh, you're going to get paid a lot of money, you, get, you know. <laughs> and so I, I, I got, I was interviewed uh, to work at HP, a printer division in Boise, Idaho. And um, I was never offered the job, but I, during the interview, I, I really knew I do not want to do this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just do okay. not. It is not something that, that I'm, I'm feeling a lot of energy around. So, uh, mm. I, so I, you know, and then that was just, again, the path that, that fell into my lap of, you know, I, I mean, I was at GVO for, I, you know, between school and so probably for five years. So I did, yeah. did have a lot of exposure to how projects run and, and that aspect of it. But I think as far as you know, setting up a business and accounting systems and all that stuff, right. no clue. we just, it just learned on the fly. Right, right, right. And, uh, but so that went on for, you know, about six years. And what, what happened was I, uh, there was, um, a guy that, um, Jeff Smith knew named Bill Dressel house, who was, he was uh, he was consulting to Apple at the time. He was actually one of the original engineers on the on the Apple Lisa, and you know he was working with their engineering group, and that was at the era when Frog Design was doing all the work for Apple, mm. um, and that was really inspirational to me. I mean, the Hartman Esslinger was one of my um, inspirations, in part as a designer, but also as an icon. You know, he really knew how to create energy around industrial design hmm. and, and really sort of understood the emotional impact that it had where a few people at that time really did. But that, that, that relationship was super tight, but you know, as you might expect, the engineering community was not happy with it because of all the power that frog had and being connected with Steve jobs. And hmm. so they, they hired me, bill did 
to work on something, but they, we, we couldn't call it industrial design. We, we had to, in, in all our documentation, had to refer to it as engineering. But it was industrial design. It was a new, a new, product, new product platform they were working on. And, and I didn't realize at the time it was, it was kind of a test. Mm. Uh, so, so we did that, and it went really well. And then they started asking to do more things. And in, in the meantime, the relationship with, with Frog ended mm-hmm. and sort of opened things up. And I started doing real above the boards projects with Apple. Mm. And one of them was the uh, Macintosh LC, which is um, at that time turned out to be the most successful um, computer they had ever made. Mm-hmm. And after that, I was approached by a, uh, a headhunter, which was kind of weird. It was, I was working for a guy named Richard Jordan. He was my main contact who ran what they called it Apple. They called it product design, but it was really sort of mechanical engineering and product development. Hmm. And, uh, but he had his headhunter contact me and they were looking for a new director of industrial design. And they, uh, asked me if I was interested. Uh, at Apple. Yeah. To, uh, going to um, run industrial design at Apple. And of course, very flattering. But I looked at it, and at that time, most of the work was de- being done externally with people like me. There was a really a small skeleton crew of a staff internally sort of managing the process and managing color and material and things. But mm-hmm. the, the real fun stuff was happening outside of the company. <laughs> and, you know, I just said, you know, I'm at this point in my career where that's what I do. And I, I, so this doesn't really interest me because they were really in a way looking for someone to come in and help lead it and really manage executives, Jean-Louis Gasset in, in particular. Uh-huh. And uh, so I said, no. <laughs> and uh, which, you know, was, I think shocking to them. You know, <laughs> sure. And, you know, cause I was, whew, I must've been around 28 or 29. That's at crazy. That time. Yeah, no, it is crazy, right? It's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but they came back three months later and said, no, you know, you're really the person we want. What, what would it take? And, you know, me, stupid me, I'm not thinking money. Um, <laughs> I, I, I said, you know, honestly, if any company could have a world-class design studio, it would be Apple. So if you want to do that, I'll do that. And they said, okay, let's do that. And, um, <laughs> you know, again, it's sort of this, you know, watch out for you, what you ask for, you might just get it. And, and so, that, so I, I, I left Lunar, which was really hard. I mm-hmm. mean, I literally, when I told Jeff and Gerard, I cried because it, it, um, we had such a good relationship and it was, <clears throat> and, and we'd gone through so much together, you mm-hmm. know, just to be yeah. leaving, leaving for another opportunity you know, was just felt really hard, but mm-hmm. yeah, I, you know, it was, I, I knew, uh, I, I remember telling them I'm young enough to make a big mistake. <laughs> so <laughs> I might as well do that now. And, uh, and so I did and, um, and went off and, and created the, uh, what I began to call the IDG the industrial design group at Apple and hired Johnny and a number of others that have remained there and, and built a, a culture of a studio and, got it functioning and did that for about seven years, which was, you know, really, really incredible, really, uh, it, as far as a learning experience, you know, it, it was, it was on the side of the, you know, how to get stuff done side. Mm-hmm. You know, I also, you know, creatively making a lot of interesting things, obviously, but also that, you know, working within a large corporation, not the size that it is today, but still, and, mm-hmm. And that even though it had a design driven culture, you still have, you know, this mass of people you have to deal with in, in figuring out how to get something done and get something unique done. So what was and, the, what was the sta- uh, two questions with that first for people who, who maybe don't know dates was cause I know Steve jobs had left Apple, mm-hmm. not exactly voluntarily and then came back. And yes. so how does that work with those dates? And then the <laughs> second question is. What was the state of the, uh, I guess, industrial design group or team, however you'd call it, at Apple when you were brought on board? Did it exist yeah. or? Yeah, so the first part, you, you set up one of my favorite jokes, um, which <laughs> um, I, when I talk about Apple, I say I was between jobs. Right? Because <laughs> he, had, he had left and, and Gasset took over. And again, I was 
you know, my most important interview was with Jean Louis, and it was really horrifying. I had this, I, I built this this amazing book, and it was all just photographs, no words, just picture after picture of things that I'd created and laid it down in front of him and tried to talk about it, but he just kept turning the pages before I could even finish <laughs> turning the pages. And then, you know, closed it. And then we had this sort of um, obtuse philosophical discussion. <laughs> and uh, and I left thinking, oh, that was horrible. <laughs> and it turned out he really liked me and and, and enjoyed that time. So that, so I got, got the job. But, uh, you know, I, I, part of it was clear. It's like, no, you got to figure out how to manage Jean-Louis because he's a loose cannon and it makes development really difficult and impossible because you know his opinions about design and so forth then so i went out <clears throat> about figuring that out but then jean louis left yeah. and 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 so he you know jobs was gone and jean louis was gone and um then it was john scully for a long time mm. and john who's still a friend was was a great man to work with and and he had he had an architecture background so he had some understanding about about design mm-hmm and then John left, and it was Michael Spindler, who also a really brilliant man, but very much an operations guy. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, after going through all that, and, and they did some really great products. I think, you know, one, one of the ones that uh, I, I look back on and am amazed on was the original Power Book. <laughs> you know, in that, uh, so, we, so we, you know, we were, Apple was one of the first projects when I came to the company, you know, and, and Apple had created this, you know, if you look at Apple history on it, the original Mac portable, which, you know, basically was a desktop Macintosh with a battery, really. Um, oh, right. It was huge. It was this, you know, it's about the size of a sewing machine and, you know, and just kind of a laughing stock from a mobility point of view. And I mean, literally you could only use it if you had a first class seat. It was so big. <laughs> and, um, and so, and then Compaq came out with this product of the Compaq LTE, which was essentially an eight and a half by 11, albeit, you know, two and a half inch thick book. Mm-hmm. But it was, you know, it sort of set the standard for what, what, what was the notebook computer. And so when I joined the company, there was this enormous pressure that we're so fucking behind. We got to, we have to catch up. Mm-hmm. And that was the, the power book program. It wasn't called that originally, but that's what it became called when it launched. And so, but then, you know, we had this fundamental issue at that time, you know, windows was becoming the dominant software, but it, people still used a command line interface. And with these notebooks, they would have little clip on trackballs and things, but it was kind of optional, right? Mm-hmm. Where the entire, um, operation structure of the Macintosh was based on having a pointing device. Mm -hmm. And so there was something we had to build into the product. And, and so there was this, you know, a lot of times you're working on things, there's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle things that, that happens when you have, you have internal components that allow something to function, you figure out where to put them and how to orient them. And we were trying to figure out what to do with, at at that time was a trackball. And there was this, this engineer, I remember John Krakauer was, you know, um, kind of, a, again, kind of a loose cannon. And he, he brought us over to his cubicle and he pointed out that in the notebook, you know, on the front uh, right was the hard drive and on the front left was the battery and there was a space in between. He said, you can put it there. And he was just thinking of this sort of like, okay, I've got this jigsaw puzzle. And we're like, well, what about the keyboard? And we push the keyboard back. And for myself and my team, it imme- immediately clicked, right? Okay, it's a palm rest. And what it does for you, from a use point of view, it creates this consistent work surface no matter where you are, whether it's on your plane tray, whether it's on your lap, whether it's on a desk. You always have this really um, defined relationship between the keyboard and the pointing device in your hands. And, and we just rushed that through production. We hardly tested all. We did some usability testing on buttons and things, but we didn't do any focus group testing. We didn't do any consumer testing. We were under so much pressure. We just, let's just do this, right? Which is kind of crazy if you think about it and put it out in the market. And today it is still the de facto standard for notebook computers. <laughs> you know, it's, been, it's been replaced by a trackpad, right? but that basic configuration is exactly the same, you know, <laughs> literally for let's see that would have been for 30 years you know <laughs> and it's it's crazy if you think about it something a, a single design 
you know, being, being a standard for that long. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it, and, and when I look back, how it was, it was totally a mess. It was just a, you know, a lot of egos, a lot of paranoia, a lot of fear, like yeah. just, you know, a lot of jobs on the line, you know, we just sort of went and did it, you know, <laughs> it I love work. It. I love it. I love the, the, the story and the idea that you could have kind of a chaos, relatively small group of people trying to figure something out. You push it out and that becomes the thing. It's, it's a beautiful aspect of design, I think. No, it is. It is. And I was coming back to saying this sort of notion of inspiration and belief. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm actually working on my second book. I did one called um, Do You Matter, which is really about the relationship between people and brands and, and how they how that happens through products. Uh, and we're working on a sequel with my co-author, his name is Stuart Emery, and it's called Making Great Stuff. And, and what it really is about when you peel away all the stories, it's about that religion and commitment it takes to actually make something great. That, again, sort of separates the good from the great is when there's this sort of really religious aspect of, mm -hmm. I believe in this thing. It has to see the light of day. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen right. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's fairly rare. So, uh, but that, yeah, that was kind of the case in the, in the, in the power book. It was sort of like, okay, this works. We don't have any choice. We believe in it. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> and, you know, the thing that's surprising to me when I look back again, you know, here's someone who's you know, about the time, about 30 years old, um, sort of <laughs> given the, the go ahead and responsibility to just take a big risk like that. It still kind of blows my mind. So. <laughs> is it, uh, <clears throat> this is kind of zooming forward in a sense, but you know, technology changes like so, so quickly and it's, it's, it impacts, um, your industry uh, mm -hmm. and all industries greatly, but industrial design, especially, Yeah, is it kind of mind blowing to look backwards in time and see the change from the, you know, the other laptop you mentioned, the two inch thick <laughs> book mm -hmm. to like what things are now, you know, the other day oh, yeah. I was holding an iPad pro. I'm like, this is like, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it doesn't make sense. No, I, you know, if when I, I can give you better, when I look at uh, my iPhone here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when I was at Apple, I started using, you know, my storytelling video in my presentations. Well, I used to have to take a, a desktop computer with two graphic cards in it and a memory card and just enable it to play like 640 by 480 QuickTime, right? <laughs> um, and that was, you know, and that was like amazing, right? It was this, this moving video in a PowerPoint. It was just, um, you know, and I looked at it was this big box I had to carry it with me to hook up to, you know, the the, the <clears throat> projector, uh, and and that is probably I don't know maybe one fiftieth of the power of the, that you have in your, I, maybe one hundredth of the power you have in your iPhone. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just unbelievable. Um, the, the, the rapid progression. Yeah. And it does, you know, it, it does make the job very interesting because there is constant change. Mm -hmm. There is always something new, always something different, always something, um, some, some inventive way of thinking about how to use information technology. And, and most of what we do at ammunition is around that within the consumer market. And then that's, that's a lot of fun, mm -hmm. but you know, there is something that, uh, I always, you know, technology you know, really enables a lot of stuff, but it is design that establishes it. Right? it. It doesn't matter how good it is. If people can't use it, don't want to use it, can't mm -hmm. figure it out. Right. So, and I think that that really led to the, the rise of the importance of industrial design in the business community was that that sort of realization is that, you know, without having that really great interface between the technology and the person, it, it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. right? that's so that's, that, that, that sort of in, in, increased that. And the other thing is that, you know, it changes constant, but nothing changes, right? If you, you know, as, as humans, we still have, you know, 10 fingers, two eyes, we still have um, the need for um, security and comfort and love. And, you know, all these things are just mm -hmm. constant, right? So yeah, all this stuff is changing around us, but people, are are pretty consistent about who they are and, and what they need mm -hmm. so that's that's another thing that's that's there's an interesting contrast of, of what we do of really looking at this fast moving train of technological development but then back to humans and what do humans need and how does it how does it really fit into their lives mm. that's great i was wondering how much how much of the the technical like the technology like all the stuff that goes into all of those products do you need to to know in order to design them 
like I understand it's a teamwork, but like, do you have to have a general idea of like, okay, I like how does the power come through? Yes, you know, like sure. all that stuff. It's, I mean, part of it is knowing enough to be dangerous. You know, you have to know <laughs> enough to figure out how something is going to work. You don't have to know everything about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's just having a general knowledge, and and every every project is different. And yeah, there is a, there is a, a learning point where you really get, need to understand, you know, the higher level what something is doing, but also get down into okay, how are all these pieces going to work together, and what's important, you know. And so when you're getting into, um, for example, there's a there's a product that we did. I have one over here. It's the June oven, which is a smart mm -hmm. oven. Yeah, a really groundbreaking product, and. You know, one of the things one of the most put the most work in is that, you know, in the front of this oven, it's all glass built into the door is essentially an Android phone. It's it's a it's a capacitance touch face, touch surface in the in the door of the oven. Of an oven that, that heats very rapidly to five hundred degrees. <clears throat> and so not only does the front have to be cool to the touch, it has this this phone has to be able to survive right in this environment. So we probably spent more time figuring out simply how to cool the door <laughs> than anything else. Right. And so you have to understand, you know, what, what are the dynamics of this thing and what are you going to need to do to enable it to work? And, and that is for me, one of the fascinating things. It's something, um, you know, when, when I, uh, when I met, um, Johnny Ivan brought him onto Apple and talked him into it. I think that was one of the things we really shared, which was that sort of, aspect of the craft of industrial design, which is I've got this great idea, you know, I've got this vision. Now I got to figure it out. Right? And now <laughs> there are all these things and all these barriers you have to overcome to make this, this thing work. And, uh, and against uh, that, I think it's a part of the, the craft that I, I've always enjoyed. But so, yeah, you have to learn about it and you have to understand it. And you don't have to know how to um, write code. You don't have to know how to um, design circuits, but you have to know how the pieces work and how they interplay together and what's important to allow it to function and, yeah. and how you're going to build something. And, 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 and then, you know, there's so many other things about reliability and um, um, sustainability. And there's just so many things that goes mm, into, yeah. into, into building a, a, a viable product. That's it's, it's, it's actually fairly mind boggling. Do you always figure it out or is there a list of products on the shelves that just never get resolved? <laughs> oh, there's, yeah, there's, there's a, you know, there's a good with anything, you know, I've been yeah. doing this a long time. So there's a graveyard of, of failures and learning experiences. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever had anything that just um, functionally failed. Okay. That just turned out to be a, a disaster in that sense. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, but you know, there are products that com commercially failed that you, you thought were going to be amazing and just never went anywhere. Uh, you know, I think when we first, when we did the first Beats headphones, hmm. we were, were really pushing some things on, on the headband construction. And initially, out there were a lot of field failures on the headbands breaking. <clears throat> it took us a while to figure out that and what was going on. And Wait, um, so real quick with that, what was the point of failure with the headbands? Well, it was, it's a really interesting question. You know, so so there, there were two. The first product was the Beats Studio. And... Hmm. So I'll get into that story a little bit because it's important to your question. So, you know, when, when I started working on the product and, you know, I looked at headphone design and headphones are, are really difficult things to design because they are highly functional, right? Mm -hmm. They're, uh, in addition to acoustics, you have to have um, um, durability and reliability under a lot of stress and load, you know, stretching and pulling and so forth. Uh, they have to be really adjustable. They have to be comfortable. Uh, there, there, you have to, you know, make, have sweat resistance. I mean, there's so many things to go into it. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the vast majority of the headphones that were being built at the time, I started working on the studio, uh, that all was reflected in the design, right? They were very articulated, mm -hmm. very mechanical, not really attractive. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so really thought, well, well, how do I change that? You know, this is a piece of wearable technology and, and, and the interesting thing about headphones, you know, it's one of the few things that people put on their heads, right? And mm -hmm. um, it's maybe remember remember Google Glass, how much people were just resisted putting any sort of piece of technology on their head. It, but headphones were sort of established. But what I drew when I was sketching was on the front view a sort of single line that ran from ear to ear. And I thought, well, how do I how do I recreate that? How do we create this? Get all that functionality in this headband structure, but make it a very simple, elegant arc. 
that was that looked good on the body. You know, even we, we were designing them that way. We were sketching and drawing and building CAD models on you know heads and trying to figure out what looked right. But you know, so so we had to have a lot happening within that. And so to answer your question, this is really I'm going to geek out on you for a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had at the termination of the headband there were screws, which we actually made visible. I thought I liked the way it looked. It made it look technical. And the, it kept breaking there. And huh. there was no reason it should have. The, the, the material was right. There's a lot of analysis that was done on it. There's no reason it should have. And what we ended up discovering was to, to get the glossy finish, um, the last step in the making of the part was a clear coat. It would be sprayed with a glossy clear coat. What was happening was when it, when that clear coat went under stress, the clear coat would crack and it was like a wedge that would oh. drive stress into the plastic and the plastic would crack. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So, you know, so that, that's the kind of stuff that you, you end up figuring out. Um, there was another product we did that just actually just got rushed through too quickly. And, and the, um, people we were working with, they wanted to get this product out and literally did no, um, no validation testing just put it out into the market and the headbands were failing right and left. And that was, that was more of a material um, design issue, which we corrected, but you know, but that's there's things <laughs> you have to be able to learn and adapt quickly to that. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that goes on after you ship a product and it does something that isn't working and everybody freaks out and <laughs> <laughs> figure out how to, how to fix it <clears throat> in, in, as quickly as possible. I remember when the Beats headphones first came out it was a big um, deal. as a designer, I was like, well, there, like, why did it take so long? To... <laughs> and they were so cool because all the headphones exactly as I said before then were always kind of audiophile looking very functional, very this or that. They had, you know, diagonal lines on them or whatever. And then the Beats headphones were just so crisp. Um, it was kind of like a breath of fresh air in a way. Yeah, it was it was another great opportunity. You know, when I, I started that, I was uh, introduced to Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, <laughs> and uh, and it was interesting that uh, you know, and So here I am, Silicon Valley born nerd, design nerd, <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm hanging out with Dre and Jimmy and Diddy and Will I Am, and you know, it was just like. <laughs> Honestly, uh, and, and so it, and, and it was started as a, as a business partnership, hmm. uh, you know, which was interesting. And I, I realized later that's just the way they operated. You know, when you create a piece of music, it's, it's really a shared enterprise. The artist of course gets a cut, the producer mm -hmm. gets a cut, the mm -hmm. label gets a cut, right? So they wanted to go at this the same way, you know, you're in this with us and I ended up investing a lot, but. You know, I, I just thought it was so much fun. I said, maybe if I just make my money back, I'll be happy. And um, little did I know that it would become such a phenomenon. And but it was really, I think, you know, I mean, there were a lot of things behind it. So Dre's thing was, you know, people aren't hearing my music. That was a, qu a quote he did in the very first meeting, which we ended up putting on the box because you know there was really this notion that hmm. he and 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 Jimmy were crafting and producing much of the popular music out in the world and they knew what it was supposed to sound like and these things right yeah weren't producing the right sound and so that was that was part that was his passion um jimmy who uh you know I, the other day he was just um put into the rock and roll hall of fame and uh, i watched that with pride because i've known him for like almost 19 years now and he um but he he saw this very simple but important thing that for his audience there's no high performance audio brand it just didn't exist right there's you know it just there's nothing for a younger audience at, at, from a higher performance point of view to gravitate towards you yeah. know skull candy was kind of cheap and didn't sound that great and <laughs> bose was your was your dad's headphone and right. you know it just didn't it wasn't there so he saw that opportunity and you know what what he would ended up doing was using all the marketing techniques that he used for an artist, but treated the headphone as the artist, as the star. And, and that was really this sort of accelerant that just very quickly in, embedded the product in popular culture. Mm. And, and which, you know, really, I, I you know, I realized over time it's that that's where um, art and commerce meet. 
is in, in culture. Huh. And it, it can be a really, really, um, really something very powerful if you, if you manage to do that. And it just, you know, it went through the roof and just, you know, and so it actually literally continued to design every, every, my team and I designed every Beats product that's, that's been made. That's really cool. Yeah. So it was, what a, it was just a, a wild ride though. So much fun. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I, again, when, when they came out, I was like, oh, these are so slick. I don't know why. And, and I think it's one of those things where they're so simple looking, which is why they're very successful from a kind of aesthetic standpoint, but it's a, probably an example of making it appear simple is really difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is that what you said right there is <laughs> one of the things, one of the, um, oxymorons of design that simple is hard <laughs> yeah 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 i mean oxymorons probably not a way to describe um contradiction simple is mm -hmm. hard you to make something simple and work and do everything it's supposed to do and maintain that simplicity especially when you're adding in technology and all the things that go into that mm -hmm. it's it's really it's really really difficult to do have you ever had a chance i'm sure you have to work on an mvp a minimum viable product and if so, is that just like the most freeing experience? Cause there's not the pressure of. Yeah, there's, there's been a few. There was, well, I mean, one, another one, I, I wouldn't put exactly in that category, but the expectations were, were kind of interesting. So uh, another really important sort of product in, in, in my trajectory was this barbecue called Fuego. And I, I was, I'd been hired by a company called Zephyr that created, um, mm -hmm sort of high end range hoods, like kitchen range hoods. And they were doing a lot of work in Italy, which was fun. And so we developed a series of, of, of range hoods and the, the gentleman who was doing the marketing for Zephyr's guy named Alex Siao, we became friends with him. Now at the same time, this is another great story. I was, uh, I was approached by a TV production company and they wanted to do a a series on design, how, how things happen, how things are made, um, called the launch. Hmm. And, and they, they wanted to film one of our projects, you know, as it was happening. And I, um, and, you know, we told them, well, that that's really not possible. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it, first of all, we, we wouldn't be able to show it for a year to year and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be able to follow all this and film all this and it just won't work. So, they were undeterred and said, well, let's, can you just make something up <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. and we'll do it quickly. So, so I said, you know, it seemed like a good opportunity. So, um, huh. we came up with this idea of developing the ultimate barbecue or a modernist barbecue. And so went and did this show and it was hilarious. It was really like, it was reality TV, but it was totally scripted and, <laughs> you know, and they were, you know, trying to create all this, you know, conflict between the different designers. And, the, you know, we had, um, I don't know if you know who Rob Forbes is, uh, hmm. founded D DWR. We were working with him at that time and we talked Rob into playing the client, you know? <laughs> and, um, so, and the thing went out and, you know, it was on like, at midnight on the discovery channel. And then actually at one time I was on a flight and there it is up on the, you know, on the, when they had the TVs on the ceiling <laughs> of the airplanes. And, but you know, I, I gave a disc of it to Alex and he watched it and just said, we have to make this thing. You know, this is just amazing idea. And, and it was a very, very clean, very simple, almost like a, a kitchen Island on wheels. And the top was teak and slate, and cast iron, and then a sort of very um, beautiful, crisp, clean stainless steel body. And it, it uh, I used to, we used to call it a campfire for modernists. But the whole idea was was around an observation that when you're at a party, people always end up in the kitchen, right? And right. they always end up, and if someone's cooking, they're around the person that's cooking. And it was sort of, well, why don't the the, the original, you know, classic Weber kettle or or barbecue that's the oil, oil, oil drum sawed in, half, sawed in half ways has this giant lid, right? And when that creates a barrier between you and your audience and your friends. So we mm -hmm. said, we'll get rid of that and just create this almost, you know, kitchen island type thing. And so, and it, it never, you know, I think at, at its peak and we did a number of project products, you know, it was at most like a seven or $8 million company, which is really small. And, but it was a passion, right? And then it was not, it was something that, uh, of course we had hopes for, but 
you know, never, there was no sort of expectation it was going to be right. the next <clears throat> big thing. And, uh, but, but it, there was a really important thing that came out of that for me was it was, and it really led to ammunition hmm. in that, you know, what I realized was here was something that I was quote unquote invested in. And this was before beats. And I was on the board of directors of this little company. Uh, but what I saw was, wow, people really listen to me. They're not treating me like the hired vendor. They're, you're treating me as the, the, you know, someone who has a say in this thing. And so I was able to really shape what it was and the trajectory of the company and the product. And that, that was really inspiring to me. And so when I was at Pentagram at the time we did this and Pentagram was an amazing organization, this fantastic, um, unbelievable talent, and wonderful people to work with. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge I had was, you know, it, 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 if you know about Pentagram, which most people do, it is, mm -hmm. you know, the oldest thriving design company in the world over 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it really is built on this partnership model, which is self-renewing as new partners come in and bring new work and new energy to the company and all their partners retire. And, uh, but the problem I had was it was largely, the partnership was largely built around graphic design and visual design. Sure. I was sort of this boutique within it of doing industrial design. And I got on some projects here and there that other people worked on, but it was really a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a, being a little bit of an outsider within it. And, mm -hmm. um, so a couple things happened. One is I, I, I did observe, you know, of course what was going on with Apple and the, uh, you know, iMac and then the iPod and iPhone and how that was, had sort of increased the understanding of how valuable good industrial design can be. And, and really through my time at Apple, I understood that, you know, building something great was really a multidisciplinary process. It, you know, the, the object is important, but everything else that goes into it is, is really important. And that was another foundation for ammunition. But the other one was that this sort of, you know, building these partnerships and having skin in the game uh, really sort of changed the working dynamic. Hmm. And, and so we, I started the office and later Matt Rollinson joined me of, of really around this idea of using design as a tool for investment. And so what we began doing was working in, you know, we still doing traditional fee for service kind of stuff the majority of the time, but then starting to do um, work for revenue sharing like beats and, and then work for equity with the um, startups mm -hmm. that we were, we were being approached by. And we built out a kind of model where we could, <clears throat> invest back into these companies we're working with and, and still you know, make our margin and do, do our work. Mm -hmm. And, and so, but what we found was really kind of surprising was that, um, you know, of course it creates, you know, business opportunity and, and we've had a few exits and that's been great, but it also changed how we work with people, you know, and, and, and really sort of taking on this, this sort of ownership, and, and, and beyond just designing the thing, it's really helping people shape their business. And, yeah. and, and, and that overflowed into everything. It wasn't just the work for startups. We began to just behave like that with our, with our sort of quote unquote normal clients. Um, and we realized it's, it's actually making us better designers you know, that we're really taking to heart the business proposition and using everything that we have to enable that. And, and, and that began to show up in the success rate of the things that we created. There was a, hmm. a point where, you know, one year, I think we, you know, for a small studio, you know, we're under 50 person studio. We had 14 products shipped in, in one year, which was pretty, pretty huge. And, and a lot of that I attributed to sort of our, our sort of philosophy and attitude that we developed. And, uh, and, and it's not right for everybody. We've actually been fired a number of times because, <laughs> well, you know, you're working with, a mid-level manager and we start telling him what he should be doing and he's sort of like well, wait a minute right we're, we've just hired you to design this thing can you just shut up and go design this thing yeah and you know we had a couple <laughs> people that just didn't didn't like it uh but but that that really shaped the the culture and the idea of ammunition and sort of you know, you know really about using design as a way to create change and as a tool for investment and to really um 
to re really sort of drive things out into the world. And uh, it's 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 really been the, that that shift has really beneficial for us. That's very interesting. So um, you had mentioned that some of the work, whatever percentage, is the typical um, uh, uh, client uh, relationship where they pay you a fee, you do design mm -hmm. for them, and that's that's what it is. Um, mm -hmm. But then a big part of ammunition is to try to be. Uh, how would it just have skin in the game, be like mm -hmm. a co-investor, have something in there. So yeah. if you don't mind, so how does that work exactly? Do you take some of the money the company have saved, saved up and put it into this product's company or do you yeah, sacrifice the, I, some of your fee? The, the, the dominant model is that we, we get approached by a uh, startup wants us to design their product. <clears throat> we develop a budget to create something and then we take a percentage of that budget in 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 a convertible note or something like that uh th that is some ownership in the company so mm. and and we do it in a way so it doesn't really jeopardize our cash flow and and profitability mm -hmm. it's, and it's um for example even on the the revenue sharing we don't like to call it royalty because we actually will um there has to be an, it still has to be an investment in our in our project it's not just we're going to do thing on something on royalty and not be paid anything and see if it actually goes out yeah. and really sort of build a model that okay you if you're serious about this you're going to have to you know essentially give us an advance on the revenue to work with and so forth so mm -hmm. uh, so we just built some models that that tended to not put the business at too much risk but allow for this potential upside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i mean currently we have a portfolio with with about 35 companies in it and we've had um about uh i think five or six equity events mm. um and and <laughs> 10 or 12 losses and the rest are just in there just kind of you know, waiting to see what will happen but yeah. it's it, it again it did really sort of change the way we, we thought about you know really how i mean for me the big change was start starting i'll never ever forget this when it changed was i had a friend who um was a software engineer and he, he'd written some code and it went out and, and made him incredibly wealthy, <laughs> you know? And I, and, <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, I'm not, my problem is, is I'm not viewing what I do as intellectual property. Right. <clears throat> I'm viewing it. I'm, I'm viewing it as a service. I got to stop doing that and, and, and view what we do as intellectual property. Cause that's what we're creating. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're creating this intellectual property that goes out and makes people hundreds and billions of dollars. Right. So that, that's great. Um, um, mechanisms that, that might allow us to participate in some of that. Fascinating, because the same question has been posed to, I would imagine, many other design professions, including architecture on our side and interior design. Mm -hmm. And um, the typical model that we see is there's a developer, they want to buy a piece of land, develop a house or a building or whatever, and the architect will say, mm -hmm. okay, I'll give you a discounted rate in exchange for a percentage of what you sell the property for. Mm -hmm. um, there are many points in that timeline of the project when things don't go right and it doesn't turn out but mm -hmm. it's um <clears throat> broadly in the broad scope i think it's very important for designers in general to think about that as intellectual property because i think that the the amount of work that goes into designing whatever object and the fee that you get for doing that is probably mm -hmm. disproportional to the good that the design can have on yeah. the general population of course i'm a designer so i'm biased but that's how i feel and i i think you know other alternative models like you're describing alternative models could be could be good for designers but also allow more good design to be produced mm -hmm. yeah it, it, it's true it's that was the the epiphany was that you know creating stuff that many times make or makes or break something right and mm. and when it makes you know it's it's in, incredibly valuable i mean if you look at and, and the beats, when we did beats, that was, you know, fortunately for us based on a participation model, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the design that we created and the identity that we created really established the value of, because the, the headphone, there was nothing new in the headphone. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, it was all stuff that was readily available. And of course the drivers were tuned a certain way and, and, but it was really design and, and marketing mm -hmm. that made it, made it so valuable. Uh, and uh, anyway, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, and you know, and that's that's that was something that actually you know, in this sort of long relationship I've had with Jimmy, that was really been amazing to me. You know, that he understood that, and you know, he's literally 
for most of his career been one of the most powerful people in the music industry. But I was always amazed at his loyalty and, and always, mm -hmm. you know, he used to um, drive me insane, right? That <laughs> you know, I, I mean, just like get these calls late at night, Saturday morning, and, and you know, I'll do my Jimmy invitation. Like, Robert, what the fuck is going on here? You know, just like, <laughs> um, and just, you know, always not happy with what we were doing, always pushing us to do more. And I just was remember thinking, what the, this is horrible. Um, <laughs> And then I, I read an interview he'd done in Rolling Stone, and he described how he worked with, with musicians. And it was exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I realized he just, he viewed me as talent, right? And I'm, he was going to get the most out of the talent that he could to uh -huh. my benefit as well. And that, that, was, that was a really interesting thing. So now um, I go down and, and visit him down in LA every so often. We kind of hang out in his backyard and really, really amazing, interesting guy. But the, you know, the fact that he's been, you know, loyal to me for nearly 20 years is just incredible. That's amazing. I think the the kind of perspective that the, the other people you work with, when they view you in a different way, kind of like you said earlier, they don't view you as um, kind of a service to hire, just do what I say, but mm -hmm. they, they, they understand the value you're bringing, even if they <laughs> decide to push you and call yeah. you on a Saturday morning. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and that's important. And I think it's something again, the designers need to realize you know, that's, that's one of the messages I've been trying to give to people starting out in the business is, you know, don't discount what you do. It's, it is, you know, it, it sometimes gets that way in the business world because you went to art school or, mm. you know, you're, 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 you're a little different or whatever, which is a good thing. But you, what you do is, is incredibly valuable and understand that and use that power. I want to ask you. Go ahead. I'll go for it. I want to ask you about identities, branding, marketing, that mm -hmm. whole kind of aspect of <clears throat> design, because um, you know, obviously, ammunition does that. You have a lot of background mm -hmm. in doing that very successfully, mm -hmm. but it strikes me as being potentially a, a somewhat different category from just creating the object itself. Mm -hmm. um, and you went to industrial design school. You had experiences, but w when did this? Uh, branding expertise develop because I do see a lot of designers who are good at creating the thing, whether it be mm -hmm. the object or the architecture or whatever, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily good at understanding, <clears throat> uh, call it the patch packaging aspect, the mm -hmm. branding aspect mm -hmm. of it. Well, I, I, that developed it, you know, when, um, when I was at Apple and as I said earlier, I began to realize I, so I, I used to, um, when I was lecturing, I, do this little exercise and I, I at first used an iPod and then later an iPhone and put it up on the screen and, you know, with its interface on and packaging and, and say, what, what is this? And of course the students say, Oh, it's an iPhone. All right. And I say, they will close your eyes. Um, take away the logo, take away the operating system, take away the package, Take away the experience you had in the Apple store buying it. Take away everything you did learning about it. And what do you have left? It's a nice object, mm -hmm. but it's not, an, it's not an iPhone, right? All that stuff <clears throat> gets put together, you know, to create this experience, you know, that, that people love and, and are, are attracted to. So, so for me on the beginning to understand that was, was how I began to understand the importance of, um, identity and communication and, and, and packaging and out of box experience and all the things that you do when you, when you get a product. And if you think about the really satisfying product experience you've had, it's, it's kind of started when you first started learning about it mm -hmm. and then you acquired it and then you got it and you opened it up and then you figured out how to use it. And then what happens when it doesn't work and, all those things sort of lead you into really your, your relationship with that company. Right. And, and that's why I mentioned a the book I wrote, um, do you matter? It was really about if, if you do all those things, well, you really shrink the gap between you, the company and your audience. Right. And you, and you, you, if you create a charismatic relationship hmm. and it takes all that stuff and doing it well. And the, the important thing, I mean, I read a book um, by uh, Marty Neumeyer called The Brand Gap, 
Uh, and that's something I'd really recommend any, any design student read. And, and one of the hypotheses he put out, which is still, I still, today when I'm explaining to people about what, what brands are tell is that um, a brand is not your logo. It's not your product. It's not your packaging. It's not your retail experience. It's not your identity system. It's none of that. What, what a brand is, is a gut feeling. It's a gut feeling you have in your heart about something. And, and when two people share the same gut feeling, you have a brand. Hmm. Right. So the important thing to know about that is you can't make people feel things. Right? <laughs> you can only influence it. And so you sort of really sort of looking at understanding what it is you're trying to communicate to people and how you're going to do that and how you do that through this experience and things that they interact with is, is really important. And, and how things are identified and, and visualized is an important part of that. And so that's, that's really why I began to, and then working at Pentagram with, with people like, you know, Paula Scher and Michael Beirut, who are literally mm -hmm. the best in the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah. at that was, um, was of course another big, big piece of education. So, so I don't, I don't consider myself a graphic designer, but I, I consider myself a student of it and, and having a, um, an understanding of how to utilize it um, to, to a good effect. Hmm. Are, are you ever uh, worried to repeat yourself in developing all of those either products or brands or stories? Like, are you always conscious to make it unique or really be true to what the product or the brand is and not and, and, and I mean, is it difficult to repeat yourself? You know, like in architecture, there is a, mm. an, an easy route in repeating things that were successful mm. or like yeah. using materials and things like that. Is that the same thing for what you guys do? Yeah, it is. I mean, you, you, have, your, you have your book of tricks, right, right. that you do <laughs> and how to make something work, you know. And, and, and again, given a lot of, not a lot of time, many times you go back and rely on those quite a bit. But, it, you know, every, everything is, you know, has different. I mean, I, we had sort of run this, um, interesting and, and it's a constant conversation in the studio of, um, you know, what is, you know, and I guess the best way I describe it is not so much, it, it's an editorial style, right? It, it's like, if you, if you think of a great magazine, whether that's, um, Esquire or W, whatever, you know, they, you, there, there is an editorial to that, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it looks different all the time, but there is a tone of voice and mm -hmm. there is, there is a belief and a value system that's there. And I think that's the way I view what we do you know, philosophically. It's not, it's not necessarily, there is a specific thing that we do to everything to sort of put our hands on it. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at our work, I'm, you can see the threads, yeah. but they tend to be, they tend to be more a little higher level and just sort of about the values that we have about what makes something good and what makes something interesting. And, but then every situation reshapes that because first of all, you're working with another group of people who also have the things that they're bringing to it. Mm -hmm. And then it's doing different things. Um, I, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the qualities I think it's underlooked as a designer is, um, is empathy, hmm. you know, because it, it, if, if you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, they, you, you will be a better designer. Otherwise you will just keep designing things for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and no one's going to uh, want to work with you <laughs> unless you get lucky. Well, some people do that. Some, you know, there yeah. are certain, you yeah. know, certain studios and individuals, um, that will go just because it's, it's Philippe Stark, right? Right. And right. that's going to bring something that you know, we're going to, we want to buy a piece of that. And, and that, and that, that's, that's totally cool. I think we, we have some of that, but then it's more, look, we're, we're about really figuring out how to build things that people really want to bring in their lives. So it means we're going to have to understand a lot about what it's doing and, and what people are interested in or what problems they have, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting topic. It's something that we think about very often because there's many ways to, to view this topic. And I think one of them is you know, talking about um, onboarding clients or working with new clients and convincing them, I've not done this type of thing before in the past, but I'm mm -hmm. going to be really good at doing it mm -hmm. because of our um, dexterity, design dexterity is what I kind of like to call it. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's uh, an easier pitch, but a lot of times I feel it's a harder pitch 
uh, when you're being compared to someone who's just repeated the same thing over and over and over because that's the the safe route. It's like I kind of know yeah. what I'm going to get, so I'm going to go with that person. Yeah, it's it's um, it, it's an easy trap to fall into. And as I said, sometimes you do that. Sometimes, like I said, that you know, it was something you know we really only have four weeks to design it. <clears throat> We're going to rely on things that we've done before and yeah. we know it will, will work and be executable and, and so forth and uh, not ha and that happens and there's nothing wrong with that something that's just the way you need to work and there is there are things like if if you're working on you know a a series of products or you know for example with with beats since we have sort of been building this brand for a long time there are conventions there that mm -hmm. we just refer to because they're part and parcel of how th the design idea behind the the, the, the product so there is, a, you know, which we refer to as a design language mm. that we utilize and, and fall back on. And, yeah. and, and that actually takes a different kind of discipline because in that case, you have to actually resist going out and reinventing things too much because mm -hmm. again, you want to build this, this, you're, you're building equity in something. Yeah. yeah it's so one, that is a, a sort of different viewpoint that you take on. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of one big, big project, <laughs> a longer term project rather than a, a yeah, one off. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want yeah, to ask yeah. you kind of about process i guess design process and also how projects happen for you guys um mm -hmm. because you your company does a, a variety of different things from industrial design to strategy to ux to mm -hmm. uh, packaging brand and all these things do you typically uh are you typically hired to do all of that for things or are you brought on to do specific aspects for uh for certain products uh a little of both. Ideally, we like to do everything, mm -hmm. um, and and that that's part of sort of creating that end to end experience. And and that's one of the reasons we like working with early stage companies a lot because we get to do that. Right, we get to not only develop the product, we develop the package, we develop the mm -hmm. identity, sort of figure out how to communicate the brand idea through all this stuff, and that that's really great. Um, and that's a lot of what we do. I mean, we sometimes we'll be hired to just do the industrial design, right. And that, that happens, uh, but that usually involves a lot of UX work and strategy and, and, and design and thinking about the product relative to a brand. We do actually do a lot of packaging and that's <laughs> because we get, we got really good at it. When, um, <laughs> well, when, when we did beats, another the responsibility had was all the packaging and, and, and not just the visual, the structural packaging and getting it and implemented and manufactured. And so really built up a lot of capability around that. We have a, a guy who actually, we have one, an office in, in Brooklyn, <clears throat> our lead structural packaging guy is a guy named uh, Hamish Thane. And um, Hamish was out here, but he wanted to move to New York. So we decided rather than lose him, we'd gain an office because he's, um, <laughs> He's so valuable, and, and he's this rare blend of um, technical and production understanding and creative ability. And so, so we just got really good at that. So we actually do a fair amount of standalone packaging programs, uh, 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 simply because we, we we got really good at it. Uh, but but ideally, we um, we like the sort of fully full encompassing, you know, really be able to figure out everything about an experience. We think that's not only leads to the best result, but no, I, to be perfectly honest, the most fun too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so when someone approaches you and say, I want to create this new product, uh, I have to, I don't know, a new mm -hmm. toaster line. <laughs> I say that because yeah. I've always wanted to design a toaster. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and they don't, they have a very vague idea of what this thing wants to be. They don't want it, they want it to be modern and clean and maybe have some smart functions. Mm -hmm. Like, where do you start? Uh, yeah. Is it market research? Is it uh, like, how, how does that begin? Yeah, that, that's a great question because <clears throat> it is really important, and especially if you're doing something that hasn't been done before, right? Uh, so we we have we have a strategy group. It's actually two guys, <laughs> <laughs> really, really really smart individuals, and the, you know the best way we describe what they do is is um, figure out what's worth designing in the first place. Because again, you spend a lot of money and time to create something. So pretty good in the beginning to figure out what's worth designing. And, and what goes into answering that question is an understanding of the, the company we're working with, the, the market space, the competition, the end user, you know, everything 
anything you can about what this thing needs to do. And, and in building this sort of framework of you know, answering this question of what, what's worth designing in the first place. And, and we spend a um, project, you know, um, one to two months just trying to answer that question. And, and, but the interesting thing about it, and from my personal process is, so then we, we, we get that information and the first thing I do is ignore it <laughs> um, <laughs> because, well, this is just part of my, my thing that uh, I, you know, you have this initial idea of something always pops in your head, but then mm -hmm. I like to put it aside and do as much of a 360 degree look. And it probably comes from what I was telling you about in school when I had the instructor that made me go home and draw 50 sketches of an ashtray. Uh, it, for me, it's an important part of validating my idea of what something should be mm -hmm. of it is doing exhaustive exploration. And I sometimes drive my team crazy because I really want, I want an entire wall filled with every possible permutation. And let's forget about the requirements for a minute. Let's forget about the bill of materials for a minute. Let's just, what can it be? Hmm. Um, because the, you, what, what happens, that information is super valuable on defining the direction of it, but, but it can also constrain you. Hmm. So, you know, so the idea of putting it aside is to open your mind up and then come back with the things that you've created and apply it against that framework. Uh, because if you let that framework couch you in, in the beginning, you're, you're really not doing the product service. You really just have to, like I said, ignore that for a little while. Let's go out and just be wild. And then we'll come back and apply these requirements that we created and see what, what really works here. Um, the other thing you find about requirements is that typically there's a couple things that you have to challenge, right? There's, there's usually some, some requirement there that is going to limit you from making something really powerful. So you, you begin to understand and attack that, right? So, mm. you know, I always, you know, we work with a lot of things and, and you end up with a lot of, especially today, even more so than ever, a lot of uh, pressure on the bill of materials, you know, what it costs to make something. And, and uh, an engineering program manager will get super myopic on that, right? <laughs> And, um, you know, but what you can find is, you know, if we spend 25 cents more here, <laughs> this thing is going to have much more value to the end user. Right. And so, you know, and that was always, I used to, I, I really, sometimes I think Excel is the enemy of design. Because, um, <laughs> you think? You know, <laughs> you know, cause you come up with this great thing and then somebody puts up a spreadsheet and says, yeah. this is going to cost us an extra, you know, 17 million dollars over 20 years or something and you're like that you know <laughs> but it may but it may make you 200 million you know that's yeah. the, that's yeah. the thing right so it's um people like numbers that's like interesting I, I i like the the the, the point of of you have the research you do, which is out the framework, as you put, which is outlining maybe the parameters or uh, and perhaps even direction sometimes, but then like suspending disbelief and saying, let's just forget about that and and to exercise the other side of the spectrum and then see how the two can have some synergy between them. I think otherwise it, it goes back to what you're saying earlier, too, of if you do a poll and you ask the general consumer, what is it you want? They're just going to tell you what they already have as opposed to... Well, and, and and if you just go with the constraints, you end up doing just problem solving, right? Creation yeah. comes from a place of some sort of freedom. So I think it makes mm -hmm. sense to kind of put everything aside and just create freely mm. uh, in yeah. some part of the process. Yeah, it's like going back to the example I gave you of the Fuego barbecue, right? Mm. If we had followed a sort of traditional route we probably would have ended up with um, a nicer version of what existed, mm. right? Um, but, you know, we had this, you know, in, in thinking about it and conceptualizing, had this observation of how people behave, right? And, right. and again, when you're, when you're at a backdoor, uh, at outdoor barbecue or at a party in the kitchen, where do people congregate around the food, right? So let's, there's an observation, let's, let's build that. And yeah, it doesn't fit any of these models that people have, and that's a little bit risky, but you could end up with something that could really change, change a, a paradigm. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's important to go through that and, and discover those things. And that's the thing is that, you know, you don't, I, um, I sometimes think my job is, um, you know, 
seeing the forest for the trees, right? Because, mm -hmm. right, you know, I, we'll, we'll do this work and everybody puts their work up on the board. And I'm always amazed at how sometimes a designer, well, there's just be this piece of brilliance right in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there and you can't see it. It's right there. Do that. You know? <laughs> um, that's, that's sometimes what I feel my job is. So. That's funny. Uh, my final question, our final question is, what is your favorite uh, product or piece oh, of God. design <laughs> or, or industrial design? Oh, I, you know, I should have been ready for that. And I always get asked that. And it's always a terrifying question to answer for me for some reason. Um, or, or is there one that makes you cry? Because we ask the same question to, to architects in a good way. often <laughs> in, a good way. And, and in a good way. Well, there's one, you know, which will probably be surprising um, because it's not a pretty product at all. Um, I'm sure you guys being architects have done some of your own, um, demolition and construction. Hmm. Have you ever used a Milwaukee Sawzall? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It is such an amazing tool. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> okay. we'll cut through anything yeah. and it's not pretty. It's not, but it's ergonomically perfect and <laughs> just, it, it works so well. I remember, I forget what first time I, when I was remodeling a house and I did it and I sawed through a piece of conduit accidentally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, so, so I, I, I the things that I kind of, I mean, there are other things like one of my favorite pieces of design that I was always inspired by was the, um, the TZ lamp by Richard Sapper. Um, I just, am, I, you know, and, and my, when I started out my, one of my primary influences was, um, um, the work of Mario Bellini. Hmm. And there he did a series of calculators and typewriters for Olivetti, um, I think in the late seventies. And this was really the beginning of, of technology design really. Mm -hmm. And, um, he had this way of, um, creating movement, movement in static objects of how the forms were together and angle. They always looked like they were just getting ready to take off or they yeah. had just landed. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> And so I have a couple of his, uh, of his, his Olivetti calculators in my collection, which I just, I look at today. And, and again, this is 50 year old work, right? <laughs> and it looks today amazing, right? Of course, yeah, we don't use calculators or typewriters anymore, but uh, you know, so that, the, and then the, the, the Tizio lamp, which I um, discovered on my first trip to, and just was just such an amazing piece of design and visual architecture. And again, the sort of movement, it's always mm -hmm. something that's always changing, right? Yeah. By the way you, you orient it around. So, so those are, I think, some of the more traditional things that I have always been fascinated with. Um, but, but the Sawzall does a great job. <laughs> <laughs> it, I think it's fitting with, with the narrative of breaking down walls or, or, or disobeying right. rules. Um, yeah. And we just spec to Bellini sofa, actually, in the house. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah, Robert, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much for making the time to be on our show and, and for this conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 212. Three. <laughs> two one three two 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 six nine five zero. You can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye.